Oh, my mic is live. I'm checking with it. Are we? Are we? Li we're live on webcast. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I know more people will be trickling in here this morning as as the DC Metro does its tricks. Um, my name is Jennifer Turner, and I direct the China Environment Forum here at the Wilson Center. For those of the uninitiated, it should let you know the Wilson Center was created in 1968 by Congress as a memorial to our 28th president. He was a policymaker and a scholar, so we meld those two things together to, to, into, this, into our current think tank. We are not a musty and crusty think tank, by the way. We have uh, about 20 different projects and programs, and we, we really focus on, on creating a platform for dialogue with government, NGO, business, and researchers in our respective areas. And I do China that little country over yonder, right? I've been here for 15 years. Um, a lot of my work is focused on clean energy, climate, and water, most notably a lot of our choke point China work, water energy confrontations. But I keep gravitating back to climate and energy, because that's the big topic. In fact, were you guys paying attention to the news last week? Last week, it was a bit, it was a, we had a, we had a lot going on. We had uh, <coughs> President Xi Jinping here in DC, and, and one of, the, of, of all the different topics they talked about Probably the one good news topic appeared to be climate cooperation um, and China committing to expanding their CO2 emissions trading program nationwide. I got a lot of calls from journalists who were like, oh, where did this come from? I'm like, well, they've been working for a long time. <clears throat> In fact, I'm lucky because today I got a couple of people here who have been working with the Chinese for a long time on things like Rick Weston here from the Regulatory Assistance Project, been involved in some of this emissions trading stuff. He does, he does things, and did you guys notice that there was the announcement that Xi Jinping talked about green dispatch? Okay, be truthful. Raise your hand if you understood what that meant when they said green dispatch. Uh, about 50-50, that's okay. We will, we will find out today why that was a very important component of the announcement, perhaps even more important than the uh, mission trading. Well, Rick will tell, we don't want to steal your thunder there. But, um, but besides, but even before the, the presidential summit here in, in Los Angeles, there was a meeting that called the U.S.-China Leaders Summit where a whole bunch of U.S. cities, states, and Chinese provinces and cities made commitments to do their own efforts to, to ramp up and speed up their, their efforts to reduce CO2 emissions. And it was very striking, particularly Chinese cities. And those of you know, who've been to Chinese cities know it's, it's a wee bit smoggy. And so a lot of the motivator behind some of this CO2 steps to cap coal, peak coal, or whatever you want to call it, is to address the air pollution issue. So today I have three people who are smarter than I am on this topic um, who are going to dive into the question of whether China, well, how China is really planning. And I think we have optimistic, can I, we have optimists here today, whether or not China can actually decarbonize their power sector, peak coal sooner. I don't know. We won't, we won't debate on when they're going to peak coal. I already mentioned we've got Rick Weston, who's going to kick us off. Ta he's been doing work for many, his group has been doing work for many years in China, kind of soup to nuts, everything with on grid issues from regulation to governance to energy efficiency. He's got it all, pricing, modeling. Don't be bored. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> um, John Kreitz, he's the managing director at Rocky Mountain Institute, where he leads their research and collaboration activities across a whole bunch of areas from transport, electricity, industry buildings, but you're here today because you had the China program. You founded the China program. That's right. And, is, and you guys took the Rocky Mountain Institute's Reinventing Fire in program in the U.S. and you translated it to China. Absolutely. A vision to try to really ramp up renewable energy, clean energy path. And now about five, six years ago, having someone that would come to me say that we could do a lot more renewable energy, I'd be, like, I'd be a little skeptical. I'm no longer a skeptical because there are people like you guys doing this work. So Rick, so John's going to talk to us about that. And closing us out is a frequent presenter here at the Wilson Center. We'll punch your card after you're done today. <laughs> um, and a loyalty program. <laughs> a loyalty program. <laughs> I bought you a coffee this morning. It's yes. wonderful. She, you come and speak, I buy you a coffee after a few times. Um, she's the editor <laughs> and founder of the China Dialogue. I assume that while maybe many of you didn't know Green Dispatch, I'm sure you know um, China Dialogue. It's an independent, non-commercial, bilingual website. Well, now it's actually trilingual. You guys, you're, we have got about 12 languages altogether. We have a Latin America site now. I know. Spanish, Portuguese, and English. And then we have all the Indian. Uh, yeah, because your website said bilingual. Well, yeah. For in China, it's bilingual. Yeah. But they, they're a multilingual website. <laughs> but they, they started off, as the name implies, you know, they focus on China, looking at environmental issues, climate issues. 
They're the best storytellers out there on what's going on in China, but also communicating the stories from the world to China. She's going to be talking and in, in, in thinking about decarbonizing the China's cities and grids and things. She's going to talk about the nuclear power program in China and that it, because it is a strategy that's meant to lower dependence on fossil fuel, I think it'll fit in nicely because that nuclear power has to also fit on the grid. It will come together. All right, are you, guys, are you all ready out there? Yeah. Yes, all right, a little affir affirmation <laughs> out in the audience. And so I'm going to have, um, now and I believe that, Rick, you're going to be without PowerPoint, correct? I will be without PowerPoint. <sighs> Brave man. You guys ready for this? All right, <laughs> a PowerPoint-free presentation request. You're going to sit, you're going to stand. I, I'll sit if that's okay. You can sit, you can do it. It's, it's, it's your time, sir. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Jennifer, and thank you all. It's an honor to be here. I love coming to D.C. and talk about these issues and uh, to work with my friend John. And I read the China Dialogue all the time, but I'm, it's, this is the first time we've <gasps> met, so thank you. Wow. This is great. Awesome. I'm going to tee up uh, the discussion today on a number of points, and John and Isabel will, will fill in, I'm sure, many of the gaps. And then my understanding is that we'll have a lot of time for Q&A. A Q &A, lot of time for Q&A, yep. And we can clear up all the misapprehensions I, I spread. Uh, <laughs> I want to I start with a few basic facts that you probably all know, but I always think they're worth starting with. Uh, the world, as you know, burns some 8.2 billion short tons of coal annually, and 25% of that goes to produce electricity in China. Another 25% of that goes to support industry in China. Okay, so half of the world's coal is burned in China. And that is one of those show-stopping facts that uh, keeps us returning to China uh, to, help, uh, to help our colleagues there think about the problems and ultimately, as Jennifer said, decarbonize the economy. And that means getting rid of coal. Okay, um, global CO2 emissions in 2013 were roughly 36 gigatons, 2.5% two and a half percent higher than they were in 2012 and 61 percent higher than they were in 1990. And as you know, all our emissions targets relate to the 1990 number. Uh, so we have <coughs> a long way to go. Obviously, the, uh, most of the, uh, the growth in carbon emissions have come from Asia in the last 20 years, uh, obviously China and, and India. It's important to know that China has done some, has adopted some very important and strong policies uh, for reducing air emissions and carbon emissions over the next uh, 10 to 20 years. Uh, by by uh, 2020, they will have a 17 percent reduction uh, in carbon emissions from 2010. Uh, and um, um, those numbers we can translate into, uh, into tons if you want, but uh, uh, the percentages are pretty high. Uh, it's also got binding targets to reduce its energy intensity. It's a measure of energy use per unit of gross domestic product, uh, as well by about 16 to 17 percent by 2015, and then another doubling that by 2020. In 2020, 15 percent of its primary energy will be served by renewable resources. And if you've seen the numbers of the growth in wind and solar, uh, wind uh, in 2010 amounted to 31 gigawatts. Now that's about the size of all the capacity and power generation that serves New England. Okay, uh, 100 gigawatts in 2015. This year they'll hit that target or exceed it. Uh, and then 150 by 2017 and 200 gigawatts by 2020. These are the targets. Uh, with solar, yeah, they're huge Crazy targets. Numbers. And they are the <laughs> largest uh, uh, installer of solar and, and wind. Uh, as, with, as with wind, solar goes mm. from uh, just under one gigawatt. And for those of you who know where I'm from, which is Vermont, along with Sandy Waldstein of FERC, who's sitting here, uh, about one gigawatt is Vermont's peak load. So uh, <laughs> we're, no we're noise in Beijing. Um, <laughs> But uh, solar in 2010 was about 0.86, and it's going to go to 35 by this year. They'll meet that target, and 70 gigawatts by 2017. So that means more solar installations, more solar capacity in China in two years than would be needed to serve all of California's peak load. Okay, so to put that in perspective, the total capacity, 
total amount of generating capacity in the Chinese electric system was 970 gigawatts in 2010 and will top out at about 1,500 gigawatts this year. That's a 53% increase in five years. As you know, the installations of new coal facilities have been, until this past year or so, the past couple of years, have been huge, about 100 gigawatts a year, anywhere from 60 to 100 gigawatts a year. That's, again, three times uh, all of New England. Okay, and there's some other numbers. Uh, you've heard about, you may have heard about a coal cap uh, requirements. There are three regions in China that have uh, mandatory coal caps, coal reduction caps, the Beijing area, the Shanghai area, and uh, Guangdong, the Pearl River Delta. All, that, that serves about 70% of the population of China, and they have uh, reductions that they have to meet in consumption of coal by 2017. Uh, colleagues, our colleagues, uh, RMI and others uh, in China right now are working on developing a blueprint for a national coal consumption cap, uh, which would top out somewhere, it, numbers could be they're variable, but over 4.1 billion tons per year to peak uh, Chinese coal consumption. What's, what was that again? 4.1, 4.2 billion tons per year, which is a huge number, but the idea here is to peak it, stop it, get it to uh, uh, its maximum amount as soon as possible so that we can start reducing coal consumption in the years to come. And John's going to talk about how the reinventing fire vision achieves this. Um, okay, a year ago in, Nove in November, you know, there was a, uh, a, an announcement by Presidents Xi and Obama uh, on climate change. The U.S. committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by about 28 percent below our 2005 levels. That would be by 2025. And China agreed to reach a peak in its carbon dioxide emissions by around 2030. It's a very conservative goal. Chances are China will achieve it before then. But in order for that to happen, coal consumption in particular has to peak at least five years earlier. And we think can peak, in fact, in this decade if they really wanted to, if they really put their minds to it. Uh, obviously, the, the real issues in, in questions like this are, are not whether they can be done technologically, but whether they can be achieved politically. Okay. In March, a major announcement that we've been waiting for for a long time came out. It's called Deepening Power Sector Reform. Uh, the National Development and Reform Commission jointly with the Central Committee of the Communist Party, and that was unusual, issued this document called Deepening Reform, and it calls for what we would consider to be major reforms in the power sector. Uh, introduction of more competitive means, as they said, increased use of market mechanisms, uh, protection of uh, residential and agricultural consumers, which of course makes things very, very interesting as a matter of regulation and, uh, uh, and uh, reform to a more competitive environment. Uh, specific uh, requirements for reductions in energy usage, emissions, and uh, for the increased use of uh, renewables, and in particular, distributed renewables, uh, and reform of the uh, governance and regulation system. And there were a number of things that, they, that, that these documents talked about, and there have been several uh, implementation documents since then. And we've been waiting for a handful more, uh, which I think will be coming now that this visit is over. So we'll see. We should you know, keep your eyes and ears open for more uh, implementation uh, pronouncements on power sector reform in the coming uh, weeks and months. And then, of course, there was, was Friday's there was Friday. announcement. Um, but before we get there, it's important to know that in August, revisions to the Chinese air law were adopted. And they go into effect January 1st. And these are really important. Because as Jennifer said, air pollution is a major driver, if not the driver, of energy policy in China right now. I'm not going to go through it in detail. We can we come had back a meeting, to We had a meeting two weeks ago on that law, oh, so we're good. Yeah, so you're good. Right. But I do want to point out there are two articles in it of particular interest, Article 32 and Article 42, which go to the question of how the electric system gets operated. Now, what's important here is that for the first time in China, a direct link between 
environmental policy and energy policy has been made in the two documents, deepening power reform and the revisions to the air law. And now the third thing has happened is the Xi-Obama agreement on, on, um, on Friday, which once again explicitly relates energy policy to environmental policy, and that's critical. And that is a governance issue because the environmental regulators are not talking to the uh, energy regulators, okay? And that's typical not only in China but around the world. Uh, and so uh, uh, increasing the dialogue, facilitating the dialogue amongst those regulators uh, is critical. And it's, uh, it enables joint policy initiatives that, would, that oftentimes work against each other when regulators aren't talking to each other. Um, okay, so I'll pass that on and let's get to uh, the announcement. Article 12 of Friday's announcement is what uh, we're all excited about. And in, in effect, there are two major issues. One is emissions trading, a national emissions trading scheme for carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases in China, which will go into effect in two years. And the Chinese have been talking about this for some time now. Uh, and now it's confirmed, and this is terrific. The other element of it is the one that Jennifer alluded to and that I'm particularly excited about <laughs> is what is called Green Dispatch. Um, for those of you who took Microeconomics 101, the operations of the electric system are a textbook opportunity to learn how economics works, okay? And, and this is really important. Uh, <laughs> We can't store, I'm going to take a, just a couple minutes to do this, if you don't mind. We can't store electricity, you all know that. Um, so we have to, uh, 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 someone somewhere is turning on a switch or turning up a dial or turning down a dial every time you reach for your electric lights or you, know, you turn on your, you know, your air conditioner. Every time that happens, somebody, and in this region, that person is in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, is flipping a switch so that more electricity can be provided or less electricity can be provided. Because again, we can't store it, so we turn on and turn off generating facilities around the region to meet changes in demand. That simple act is determined by a very simple rule, the cost of operating the machines, the variable cost, the fuel cost. We turn on our least expensive machines first, and we turn on our most expensive machines last. And those are the ones we use the least. Well, that's not what happens in China. In, okay. Oh, man. Okay. In, in, in China, and you've got to hand it to the Chinese. This is terrific. Um, in, in China, they do it a different way. Um, a, a fine socialist institution uh, uh, is that all the generators get about the same number of hours of operation every year say 4,500 to 5,000 hours. We're talking about the coal units now, the thermal guys. They get a contract for a minimum number of hours a year, and they get a price per megawatt hour of production. And that price, when you multiply it times their capacity and the number of hours a year, will produce enough revenue to cover their variable costs, their fuel costs, plus their capital recovery costs, you know, their debt service. You know, they got to pay the bankers and the stockholders. If there are any, it's the, the obviously they're state owned, but you get the idea. Um, if they operate fewer than that minimum number of hours, they don't recover enough of their capital costs and they scream bloody murder. The rule in China is called equal shares. And if there's not enough generation, you know, not enough demand to go around, everybody gets cut back. And if there's more than enough, everybody gets, you know, uh, uh, increased roughly equally, equal shares dispatch. This, is, this system of dispatch has had a very profound and positive effect on the maintenance and availability of generating units because if you don't operate, you don't make any money. But it hasn't worked for operating the system most efficiently. And what John's going to tell you, I'm not going to steal his thunder, but John's going to tell you what a simple change in the operational approach to the system will do for reducing costs and reducing emissions. I'm going to tell you what our work has done, has said. Um, on the cost side, it could be as much as 10% in cost could be reduced just by going to the system of dispatch that we use 
here in the United States. We do it through a bid-based system, a competitive bidding system here in the East Coast. Uh, but other parts of the country do it simply on the basis of your fuel costs. So if Jennifer's fuel costs are three cents a kilowatt hour and mine are two cents a kilowatt hour, I operate more than she does. Okay? Uh, those cost savings in China over the next 10 years could be as high as 10%. That's a lot of money to save. The emissions reductions in the work that we've done uh, have ranged anywhere from 2% to 4%, just in emissions, because you're using the more efficient units first. And the more efficient units produce fewer emissions, both carbon and other pollutants. Okay. Now, a quick story. In 2006, um, through a work that we were doing with our uh, uh, colleagues in China, the Energy Foundation and others, we brought to the U.S. a key staffer of a regulatory body in China that no longer exists. It's since been, re it's been merged into another one. But it's called the State Electricity Regulatory Commission. Oh, yeah. But a key staffer came to the United States and spent two months here. One month in California, at the time that California was beginning to um, uh, develop its global, you know, its climate change loading order where they were going after emissions itself. So they were thinking about climate change and, and reforms to the California system. And he was there for a month, sitting in with the regulators on that. And the next month he spent at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission with, at the time, not chair, but Commissioner John Wellinghoff and Sandy Waldstein and others, um, and learned about what the FERC does. And about six months after he got back to China, and of course we never really know how the, how the black box works, but out came this idea of what is now being referred to as green dispatch. It was called energy efficiency uh, dispatch, or we would call it environmental dispatch. Mm -hmm. And what it called for is essentially what I've just described. Marginal cost dispatch for the thermal units, but also preferential dispatch for the clean units. And in this case, clean would be the ones uh, having to do with the uh, sulfur dioxides. But all the clean units, the renewables, the hydro, and the nuclear units would be operated preferentially on the basis of their emissions. Well, it also happens that they'd be operated preferentially on the basis of their costs anyway. Anyway, excuse me. So that's why, um, for the purposes, for our purposes, when I think about green dis dispatch, I. I think about the kinds of dispatch that we've been talking about uh, based on marginal cost, because you can get a lot of savings just by running the system more efficiently. We can talk more about that in uh, the Q&A. But I think that that change is critical. But for it to work, mm -hmm. the contracts have to be changed. Again, the way I described how people get paid, if we reorder dispatch and some people operate a lot more and some people operate a lot less, there's going to be a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth. So the compensation problem has to be solved. And there are a number of ways to do that, and we can talk about that during the Q&A. But essentially rewriting the contracts uh, to pay people for availability, not for operations, but for availability, and then pay them their marginal costs for output would be a simple way of beginning a transition to a more competitive market system uh, that China uh, likes to talk about. And there are real opportunities now as a consequence of this agreement for our colleagues at FERC and DOE and elsewhere to really take a lead with the Chinese uh, on this issue. We've been talking about it a lot for the last 15 years in China, but having uh, the, you know, the, f the full force of the U.S. government uh, uh, assisting <laughs> in that, uh, in, in, you know, assisting uh, in, in this respect would be, is, is really terrific. I want to finish with just one thing. I think I probably over... You're just you're coming up to the edge there. Okay. You'll be dispatched. Okay, I'll be dispatched. <laughs> no coffee for you now. No coffee. <laughs> That's right. Um, with respect to the emissions trading systems, um, a national carbon trading system would be fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, but I would counsel no one to think that an ETS by itself will drive the kinds of structural changes in the economy, in the power sector and elsewhere to uh, achieve the kinds of carbon reductions, the deep carbon reductions that are necessary. Now, this is really important to, to understand. We talk about the European ETS and how it's not working. You know, it has worked, uh, but what we do know is that the, uh, the cap is too high and therefore the value of the 
of the um, uh, allowances is too low. But think about what has to happen to the price of carbon for people to respond to it. And we've done some work on this. We, again, we could talk about it more, but a change in the price of carbon has to be huge before it actually causes both behavioral change and change in investment. And here in America, no governor was or president will put up with huge carbon prices and hope that those prices alone will drive changes in behavior and technology. What is needed is a full suite of complementary policies to push carbon reductions with the carbon cap on the side doing the pull. One's a push, one's a pull. You decide how you want to. I'm which picturing is which. a great Dr. Doolittle infographic. Exactly. With the <laughs> exactly. Here. But we've seen this. We've seen this in the Northeast with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. That the real, uh, the real savings have come from uh, the the use of the revenues associated with auctioning off the carbon allowances and putting those monies into clean energy investments, primarily end-use energy efficiency, which has the positive feedback effect of reducing demand, reducing the cost of carbon, and also improving the economic performance of, uh, of the region and reducing emissions, of course. So it's, in my view, it's important to look at a carbon program as a complement to a, an integrated and full suite of, of um, climate and energy policies that are aimed in the long run at obviously reducing emissions, but really uh, improving the economic performance of, uh, of the region in, in question. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very All right. much. Some applause for Mr. Rapp. I'll move over here. Sure. I'm yeah. in the way. Oh, I can do it from you here. You can do it. You can be clicky. Perfect. But there, there is webcasting, so don't ping pong around too terribly much. All right. Well, terrific. Thank you, Rick, for that uh, really wonderful summary of where China is right now in its overall electricity <laughs> sector. And thank you, Jennifer, for the invitation to speak here today. Um, I, uh, you know, when you talk about transforming a, an electricity sector that's 80% based on coal, it is indeed a transformation that has to happen. That's the current. And when I turn to nature to think a little bit about what transformation looks like, there are two kind of iconic uh, transformations that happen in nature that we're all familiar with. One, of course, is the tadpole to the frog. The second is the caterpillar to the butterfly. And I have a particular affinity here because I may not look it, but last week I became the grandfather of a baby monarch caterpillar that was hatched in our, uh, in our kitchen <laughs> after two weeks of diligent milk weeding by my daughters. So, so here we go. But just on this idea of transformation, we do have you know, kind of the notion of going into this cocoon state and suddenly blossoming outward. And in China, perhaps has done this in ways that are remarkable uh, when we think about the course of human history. And in particular, if we think about where Shanghai was in 1987, and this is, of course, is the Pudong skyline in 1987, um, and we think about where it is today, that very much embodies the transformation that, that humankind is capable of. And very much, at the same time, what the challenge is for China around the electricity sector. Because again, we're moving from 80% coal to something substantially different in the largest, most complex machine that's ever been built by humankind. And that is the Chinese power grid. It has more miles of transmission, more miles of distribution, more generation capacity than any other grid in the world. And we need to, again, think about what it's going to take to transform that. So again, I, I just go back to history and look at what China has done before. And this is what happened between 1980 and 2011 when China addressed poverty. Um, and you start at a date in 1981 where more than 90% of the population was living on less than $1.25 a day, extreme poverty by the World Bank statistics. And today, in 2014, it's much below 10% uh, that is living in that same standard. So there's been a remarkable change that's happened. And that's happened for electricity as well, where we had about 300 kilowatt hours per capita per year uh, being the, the norm back in 1980 moving to about 4,100 uh, kilowatt hours per capita in uh, 2014 as of last year's statistics. So you think about that, electrification is very much correlated, urbanization is very much correlated with this massive improvement in overall 
uh, economic productivity of China and its ability to lift uh, uh, the country out of poverty. So of course, this is recognized at the central levels. It's also recognized that there needs to be a balancing of, uh, of overall emissions with economic growth. And that's really led for the uh, energy revolution that President Xi has called for, the ecological civilization, and in particular, uh, this revolution in the production and consumption of energy. And there are four big principles that align beneath that, right? One is the elimination of irrational energy consumption. So there are many places where China uses energy in ways that aren't as productive. And in fact, if you look at the Chinese economy, it is extremely good at using a lot of energy and then term term turning it into a limited amount of economic value, <laughs> right? That is uh, <laughs> fundamentally a major challenge when you think about it. And the result is that it puts out steel longs and massive amounts of concrete that are lower quality and in the end uh, receive less of an economic premium going forward. Secondly, diversifying into non-coal resources. Clearly we understand that from Rick's discussion here. Third, using the market in a hybrid fa fashion really to play a more decisive role and help optimize some of the decisions that are being made. And fourthly, to reform the governance process that exists in many institutions that have been uh, either governmental or in business uh, very much created an entrenched and slower moving economy than what the government would like to see. So I'm going to talk to you here today about some work that, re that Rocky Mountain Institute has been doing together with Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, with Energy Research Institute under the NDRC, as well as with uh, Energy Foundation China. And I will say that Rick and his team at RAP have been extremely supportive and helped us thinking through the electricity sector issues as well. But it's been over two years that we've been working to analyze the Chinese economy, building one of the most sophisticated uh, energy models that yet exists of the economy, in particular around uh, ele the electricity sector. We, we created a model that uses uh, essentially the, uh, a, a high penetration renewables model akin to what NREL's uh, REEDS model is um, in order to model China uh, using 36 different balancing regions, taking a look at what's possible in terms of dispatch reordering, uh, economic consequences, et cetera. So everything that we've done in our analysis has been focused on the economics because our strong belief is that China can transform its economy, address these ecological issues, and at the same time improve the overall growth and, and wealth of the country going forward. Um, so that's been a bit of our background. What I'm going to show you here is research that has not yet been published. So I would ask that you please maintain it in confidence here. Um, if you have questions around some of the visuals that are here and would like to use them in some form or another, please talk to me about it and I will uh, be happy to support you in whatever your needs are. But again, you can expect this to be published likely in January of this year. The numbers are nearing uh, finality, but they're, because our partner is uh, the leading energy think tank in the central government, we're still working with the Chinese government to uh, receive final approvals on publishing for uh, full public consumption. Um, so how do we think about transforming uh, the Chinese energy sector? Um, first, there is a challenge of, of really massively reducing overall demand. And for us in the electricity sector, that's about energy efficiency, but it's also about making higher quality materials that last longer. It's also about uh, producing things that are in near net shape form, so you use the minimum amount of energy and materials required to get there. And based on our analysis, what we see is that China can basically grow its economy sixfold by 2050 using about the same amount of energy today through strategic restructuring of how it makes what it makes uh, and, and really thinking about whole systems design in the process. So this is a key aspect of our work, right? Um, secondly, on the supply side, when you think about having a much smaller amount of energy required, uh, we can rebalance that through using more renewables where possible um, to produce a much higher percentage of the overall energy consumption. So in uh, 2050, based on our numbers, on our base case, what we call our reference scenario, we see that uh, coal has roughly 40%, again, of the overall uh, generation or energy portfolio. We think the economy, based on our bottoms-up modeling, can shift over to have almost 
three-fifths of that economy be non-fossil generating by dramatically compressing overall demand at the same time that you expand the amounts of renewables and others uh, integrated in in the process. And I'll get into the detail specifically around the electricity sector here in a moment. But these two elements of one, massively reducing demand, and secondly, restructuring supply are core to the reinventing fire methodology and approach. And what we get in the end when we combine these two pieces is, again, a Chinese economy that grows 600% by 2050, one that uses about the same amount of energy as today, just 13% more in order to get there, one that uh, uses 56% non-fossil emissions or, or non-fossil energy in the process, reducing overall carbon production by about 35% or so from 2010 levels. Now, the best news about this is that it can all be done at a net benefit to the economy. Based on our numbers, it's roughly a 22 trillion RMB net NPV net savings to China to proceed with this, um, this approach. So that's kind of the high level. If we jump into the electricity sector and what exactly is going on to allow this to, to be transformed, first, as I mentioned, there has to be a, a focus on energy efficiency and overall reducing the amount of load that needs to be met, both in peak form as well as in uh, absolute uh, terawatt hours generated. Secondly, you need to migrate toward a generation fleet, in particular the large scale generation, create much more balancing capacity. So push for flexibility in units to allow uh, some of the uh, curtailment issues to be solved uh, and allow, um, in the end, uh, the use of that capital in an ongoing way that creates the greatest benefit for China while minimizing the amount of emissions that are produced. Third, as Rick mentioned, there's a, a new emerging ability to use distributed energy resources. And so that's going to be a crit play a critical role here to China to, to decongesting the grid in different places and allowing economic sources of energy to be used going forward. And fourth, really thinking about the system in an integrated way where supply and demand can be managed simultaneously, moving toward an integrated resource planning approach is kind of the four, fourth key component to the transforming the electricity sector. Just to give you a snapshot of what things look like in our, our modeling case, by 2050, you get to a point where we have uh, fi over 500 gigawatts of distributed PV that's, that's spread throughout the, the Chinese grid. About 3% of um, the peak load is managed through demand response. Uh, er, through EV and battery storage, you have equivalent to about 1,000 gigawatts of overall storage capacity that's linked to the grid to, again, allow the, any mismatches in supply and demand to be carried through over time. So that's the, the general uh, trend in our analysis. When we think about overall the economics of solar and wind against coal, China is quite a bit different than the United States, right? In the United States, we're at a point right now where wind is uh, among the cheapest assets that can be built. Solar is getting there and on a retail cost basis, very competitive right now in many parts of the country. But in China, building that, those uh, you know, thousand gigawatt or thousand megawatts every week for the past several years has made them able to build coal at a much cheaper level. And so coal is still the cheapest form of generation in China and will be to about 2025. And in 2025 or there around, we see you get to a point where on a total cost basis, wind and solar start to be more competitive. And for new build would be the preferential build at that point. Now by 2035, based on, again, reasonable learning curves, uh, cost compression that's, that's been proven out in the industry, we see that, that wind and solar actually, their total cost is actually lower than the marginal dispatch cost of coal. And at that point, what happens is where coal isn't needed for um, managing the grid, it ultimately becomes a stranded asset. And so managing against stranded assets is a key issue that the, the Chinese grid needs to think about and work through in managing uh, the reform here. So what does this mean for overall strategies? Today, we've got coal cheaper than the competition, uh, in 2025, alternatives will be cheaper than coal. We took a look at it and tried to balance things out to say, how do we minimize that stranded capacity um, so that China doesn't have the drag on the economy of lots of idled coal units? And what we found is that 
through creating a vibrant demand response market, through capturing a reasonable amount of that energy efficiency consistent with what Vermont and others have done here uh, in the United States, through meeting existing renewable targets, and most importantly, through moving to a least cost dispatch system akin to what was announced on Friday, China can actually avert the need for most of the, just about all new coal, except in specific pockets of absolute need here, between now and 2025 when renewables become cheaper, right? So these are important reforms that are all critical to China minimizing the amount of stranded assets and being able to move forward again uh, toward a much cleaner, lower carbon grid. So what happens when all this is added together is what you see on the left, uh, there's still uh, in the base case a monotonic increase in generation requirements over time. Our reinventing fire scenario based on all the optimizations, still uh, you know, more than doubling of the amount of electricity that China is going to need, but a massive shift toward uh, reducing the amount of generation that's required by coal over time. Right? Um, also, what you see here as well is that nuclear drops a little bit in terms of its overall requirements as well, because China simply wouldn't need the massive baseload capacity that nuclear requires. And so there's a, uh, you get to the point where building too much nuclear actually creates an asset that's uh, overly idled in the process. Um, so on the cost basis, again, when we do all the rate calculations and look at this, the ironic thing is this is actually the cheaper approach for China in the end, due to fuel cost savings over time um, and due to uh, additional, uh, the ability to, to bite off capital chunks in much smaller pieces um, and uh, manage costs accordingly allows uh, the overall cost of the electricity in the reinventing fire case to be about 10% lower overall, which is very consistent with RAP's numbers. So no fighting. No, no fighting. We're... <laughs> I yeah, was thinking beforehand we might have some. We left there. the gloves back in the, uh, <laughs> back in the lockers. We're doing okay. Um, so, you know, when we think about the broader transformation that China uh, needs to go through in the energy sector, there were three big, you know, kind of horizons of activity that, that working together with Energy Research Institute we saw. You know, first is very much what's in, in play right now, the war on pollution, the restriction of overall air emissions, SOX, NOX, particulate matter, uh, really being the dominant theme in this decade, right? 2020 to 2030, very much about how to peak carbon, and in the process, peaking industrial emissions and oil demand at the same time, right? And then in the third stage is moving to the large-scale decarbonization uh, process here, where you see uh, the ramp up of the building of renewables, but uh, and overall the movement of coal to a support role within the grid for overall reliability reasons. So there are, you know, this is a beautiful picture, very compelling. Everyone would want to jump on it right away, but there are challenges for China here going forward, right? Uh, certainly we've seen the stock market, uh, a little EKG here of the Chinese <laughs> economy over the past several years, um, where you get a, a sense for uh, some of the challenges. And thank goodness that, you know, overall the capitalization of China is largely in banks and not in the stock market, because this could mean a lot uh, bigger challenge for, the, for them going forward. But, there are significant challenges to proceeding with a transformation of the economy like this, right? There is the lack of market experience and background there, and the fact that um, their kind of regulating market is something new to China and jumping in on things like the stock market can ultimately lead to challenges in the electricity sector too if there's a push to move to least cost dispatch and you don't balance out how exactly uh, the mechanisms are put in place. You know, there are all sorts of other issues in terms of labor capacity, capability. There's the allure of gas and sin fuels, you know, as potential other options. Um, you know, the ability to uh, uh, really um, revert to old growth models of simply build more and in the process stimulate the economy at a downtime, you know, is a very tempting approach. So all these different things and, and of course, you know, within the electricity sector, reforming the state-owned enterprises is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. Um, so that they have a way to earn in the process of pursuing these types of reforms. So you can think about the same types of electricity business model innovations in China as being absolutely necessary to make the transition as they are in the United States, but applied in a very different context. So where we are in the end then is back to our little caterpillar who's thinking about transformation here. <laughs> and it, again, we, we get encouragement within China because of the large scale 
um, the effort that the Chinese economy and the Chinese government is putting into a number of different themes that are acting at a scale that, frankly, Western highly capitalized markets are self-organizing around but not pursuing issues around the circular economy or the carbon market issue. And the carbon market, China has just last week, through this announcement, created the largest carbon market in the world. And, and say what you like about the efficacy of carbon markets. You know, it, it is very challenging to get them to work properly, but the process of being able to measure and manage and uh, understand all the trade-offs that are being made is going to accelerate China's ability to solve this particular problem and challenge. And when we think about this dispatch question, Rick had gave me the nice tag to, to put it in terms of overall carbon emissions reductions. When we do our calculations on it, what we say is, you know, in, in last year there was, or in the first half of this year, about 15% of wind and about 10% of solar was curtailed due to the lack of this dispatch mechanism. All right, so you add that all up and that's about 20 megatons of emissions that China could take immediately off by actually running the units that are least cost there. Mm -hmm. Add on top of that what happens when you move to much more efficient coal plants running more, much less efficient coal plants running less. Uh, we see about a 4% uh, shift in overall generation from plants with heat rates up in the 12,000 range down to plants with heat rates in the 8,000 range. Together, the, that one action probably pulled out about 200 megatons of carbon from the, the Chinese economy as soon as it's put into full play, which is, again, dramatic swing, difficult to, you know, lots of challenges, but incredibly encouraging when we think about solving this big challenge of the most complicated technical machine the world's ever built and, and decarbonizing in a way that allows us all to breathe much more easily at night. So with that, I'm going to stop here and turn it back to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Grandpa. All right. Now I can only think of caterpillars and cocoons. <laughs> All right. Now, so inside the cocoon, there's also a lot of nuclear power plants. <laughs> so should I come over there? Yeah, you want to. You want to come over here? I just need to work the. Uh, oh, there we go. Or do you, you're gonna, do you want me to work this okay. tag? Look. Yeah. I can, I can do the flicky, so you're going to look you at your notes on there? All right. That's fine. Okay. Uh, well, that was really exciting and wonderful. I spent, actually spent um, some of uh, last week at a stranded assets conference in Oxford uh, looking at what the world would look like if we really did decarbonize. And I, I have to say it's just extraordinary stuff. I mean, shipping, railways, you know, apart from the energy, the grid and all that, and the stranded utilities, which we're beginning to see in Germany, you know, the world's transport system looks entirely different. How much of the world's oil is spent ship shipping oil around the world? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so anyway, that was all very exciting. Um, and, uh, and I was also very encouraged to hear that we've all been waiting for the Rocky Mountain Institute's data and uh, to hear that um, it's almost here it's almost <laughs> that it's almost here is wonderful you're coming back when you have the real maybe, numbers okay maybe um, maybe uh, uh, coming down and, and just finally as, as it's kind of response on the limitations of uh, of uh, trading systems I have I have on my phone a little app which tells you the current carbon price in Europe I'm sure you want to know this it's uh, 7.93 euros uh, this is completely useless in terms of transformation uh, the UK <laughs> has a the UK has a slightly higher, we have a floor price, so it's about 18 euros in the UK, but still that doesn't drive anything. So, so do not put your faith in trading systems. And actually one of the things that I don't entirely forgive your great country for is insisting on trading at Kyoto instead of tax, mm -hmm. <laughs> because you couldn't say the T word, and, uh, and now we're stuck with it. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we couldn't implement ours, right? Oh. Yeah, right, exactly. So <laughs> life's, not, life's complicated. We are right? not taking the rap for that. OK. <laughs> now we but have I'm something pumped. to fight about, right? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, nuclear power. And just, just one more thing. I mean, there was a reference in, in, in the previous presentation to uh, irrational production and um, part of that uh, of the way China is currently dealing with elements of that irrational production including steel and cement is by exporting it and I want to talk about uh, nuclear power in um, in the context of this strategic shift uh, in the Chinese economy up the value chain all the things that we've seen since the 12 five-year plan and the role that nuclear power plays and in particular uh, the impact that it's beginning to have around the world. And I should say that I don't really have a, 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 th I can do this. 
a theological position on nuclear power, but I have to <laughs> but the more I look at it, the more concerned I do get um, about a, a whole uh, bunch of things, including cost transparency, and I suppose more importantly, um, or equally importantly, the, the impact that it would have on the UK grid to have a great block of nuclear power and the inhibiting factor that that might be to uh, ramping up renewables. So we've had a fairly kind of... Pardon? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm always, I live in fear of technical correction no, no, people no, who no. know more than I do. So, <laughs> oh, no, I was, um, I was so a dream. Until, until recently, um, you know, the, I think industry experts kind of thought that nuclear power was really on its way out as a kind of, it wasn't the future, uh, because the costs and the time taken to build uh, nuclear plants was, were, were, were escalating, um, partly as a result of safety concerns. The more you try and build in safety, the more expensive it becomes, the more complicated it becomes, the longer it takes. And, and in Britain, we hadn't had one for a generation. So you can see here that the, uh, you know, that the time uh, that it was taking to build a plant was getting uh, steadily, um, uh, uh, steadily longer. And um, that although, you know, five or six years ago, there were about 67 nuclear plants being built around the world, but eight of those had been under construction for 20 years. Um, another had been under construction for 12 years, and at least 49 uh, had significant delays. So, you know, uh, th there are there aren't many countries that actually build nuclear power stations. So France, uh, which bet the entire farm on nuclear power at home, uh, so you have Electricité de France, which is the major utility, um, and Avina, which designs the reactors. Uh, you have Japan, Russia, US with Westinghouse. Um, but it's a limited, you know, uh, and business was frankly thin. Um, EDF was in particular trouble because it, it ha was trying to introduce a more advanced uh, design. And, uh, and the first prototype in um, Finland was... Uh, it still is in you know massively over time and over budget. There's a second one in um, France, but anyway, I'll come back to that particular issue. Um, and and this might have gone on being the trend, uh, except for China. So China, uh, you know, entered the uh, nuclear business uh, in the 1980s. First two nuclear power plants. Uh, one was at Daya Bay near Hong Kong, uh, then Chinchan south of Shanghai, um, and today. Uh, China now has 26 reactors in operation, 25 under construction, more about to start. So China has kind of single-handedly, uh, if you like, uh, given a, a renewed uh, boost in energy to uh, nuclear construction. So there's a twofold ambition here. One is to reduce air pollution uh, and greenhouse gases, which means uh, reducing coal, as we hear. Um, but the second one is to export. So part of the strategic economic shift that I refer to is to move up the value chain in a major way, to capture advanced technologies and so on, and, and to use this as one of the bases uh, of the new Chinese economy. So, so we see this steady uh, ramping up of, of attention to nuclear, and the 10th the, the plan had eight plants, though two of them were pushed into the 11th because they were delayed. The 11th plan was more ambitious, uh, started looking at third generation reactors and so on and so forth. Um, and at the same time, we see uh, climate goals becoming more explicit and, and tighter. So they, they tended to, um, to uh, feed off each other. Um, and, and the major... Um, a major strategic, China was, was absorbing foreign technologies because you, you don't start building a nuclear plant with, you know, a homemade kit. So it was, you know, a lot of uh, people had piled in. There's a whole range of, of different designs that are in use, uh, Russian, uh, French, uh, Westinghouse, also the, the American, Japanese. And China was in indigenizing this technology throughout this nuclear program. So you go from 1% in Daya to sort of 85% last year of indigenous technologies. And now China's almost self-sufficient in uh, reactor design. And that is part of, uh, that is a major part of the plan. So the plan now is to go global uh, with exporting nuclear t technology. Um, now, there was a little interruption here with uh, Fukushima. I'm sorry, this is a little dense, uh, but if you see, uh, can I see Fukushima, that line there? So, you know, this hasn't been entirely smooth as nuclear, uh, the nuclear industry is not. So there was a pause after Fukushima when there was a huge public concern about, suddenly about the safety uh, of nuclear plants. And um, there was a pause while all projects were reviewed 
um, after about a year, some of them, uh, the, the coastal ones basically started up, uh, but, the, uh, but the internal ones uh, are, still, uh, are still paused. Um, and they're paused partly because of other questions like the availability of water and the fear of contamination of rivers um, and, and uncertainties of that nature. So, uh, so those are, are on hold. And nuclear share, despite this big program, the share of nuclear power in the energy mix is still relatively low, it's just over 2%. And if you compare that to France here, which is, as I say, bet the farm on, on nuclear power, um, you, I'm pretty sure the United States We're is down. higher. You're halfway down, okay. Um, and China is here, right? Uh, right at the bottom is Japan, for reasons we know about. Um, um, but uh, but the but the, the the proportion is still uh, relatively uh, low. However, if you look at the number of reactors under construction, you see China is is way up at the top. So so that's kind of the uh, sort of where we are now in the kind of global pattern of construction. Um, and this is the map of uh, so planned under construction and in operation. So you see a lot of contractors are uh, sorry a lot of reactors are planned. Uh, internally, but most of the ones that have approval are actually going ahead or on the coast, and that again is for reasons that um, uh, to do with safety. So, what are the problems? <laughs> it occurred to me when I put the slide up, it began to look like all those slides you saw people looking at the uh, stock market crash. <laughs> anyway, so, so, worried man looks at wall <laughs> slide here. Um, <laughs> What's he worrying about? Well, um, th there, <laughs> there are concerns. Um, and, and obviously, you know, you can't talk about uh, you can't talk about nuclear power without talking about uh, safety. And in general, I mean, I have to say, there there have been no major uh, incidents in uh, in, chi in the Chinese nuclear program that we know of. Uh, though one physicist who worked on it um, uh, has predicted that there there certainly will be. But there is a history in China of doing things uh, very fast. Uh, sometimes with completely disastrous results. Uh, the, the words great leap forward strike fear into the heart of anyone who knows Chinese history. And, and there is a tendency to, to uh, make a decision at the top and then to build out extremely fast. So think of the dam building program in the 60s and, the, and the, in the f late 50s and early 60s. The world's m biggest ever cascade dam collapse happened in China in the mid 70s. It was a state secret for 30 years. Um, there were there were you know more more dams have been built and more have collapsed um, than than anywhere else. Uh, the high speed rail program again was built out very fast. There are a lot of concerns about the uh, safety of the uh, of the track bed um, and indeed of the uh, of the operations. Um, these concerns were not. Um, it was nothing particularly reassuring uh, of the uh, the crash in Wenzhou, which happened, uh, which again caused great public anxiety about the state of uh, about the state of safety on the railway system. Uh, other major engineering projects, again, you know, um, were the result of very big central decisions and and not necessarily uh, reviewed uh, entirely objectively by regulatory or uh, safety uh, bodies. Now, that's not to say that it can't be done, um, but, but there are concerns. And, and I think one of the issues that arises in Chinese public policy is that once a decision has been made, it becomes very difficult uh, to uh, review it or oppose it uh, or reverse it. And with a nuclear program, this is really quite serious. So there are a number of voices that have raised concerns about, again, really about the speed. Um, because you know you can you can learn to build a plant. And Chinese are extremely talented engineers, you know, in, in, in really every field. And, and and it's not about it's not so much about the engineering, but it is about the corner cutting. It is about when you try to do something very fast. You know, is there a temptation to cut corners, particularly you know in a provincial uh, project, for instance? It is also about uh, the lack of experience of the regulatory regime. And if you think of Japan, which is a very you know, technologically sophisticated society and what happened at Fukushima uh, and, and the many failures in the system that led to uh, that accident, then, then you can see that the concerns are not about China's lack of, of capacity, but they are about the lack of experience. Um, 
And, and also, if you're building this many reactors this fast, you need a lot of very trained and experienced staff. Now, again, you can train engineers, but to build a safety culture uh, takes time, which is why I think uh, people like uh, Hezo Shok, who was, uh, is, is a retired uh, physicist who worked on the nuclear program, uh, was so concerned. And his concerns uh, arose in particular about uh, with a, a plant uh, which was being built just over the provincial border uh, from his hometown in Anhui, um, and which has um, caused a lot of uh, local opposition, including at the provincial level uh, in, Anhui, um, in Anhui province. That plant is, is, uh, is under construction, in fact, in Jiangxi, in the neighboring province. Uh, it's, a, it's called Pengzi uh, plant. And um, Anhui province takes the view, and, and, and again, you find it problematic with nuclear power that those who benefit and those who suffer are not necessarily the same people. So you might have Jiangxi province benefiting from Pengzi nuclear plant. But if there were to be an accident, Anhui province would also suffer because they're mm -hmm. right next door. Um, so all these arguments gained ground in, uh, in Anhui province and, and uh, in 2012, after Fukushima, four retired government employees uh, uh, from uh, Wangjiang um, wrote a, an open letter to the State Council uh, calling in question uh, the wisdom of the plant. Um, he Zhou then piled in uh, with, his, uh, with his scientific credibility and he, he wrote an article opposing not only that plant, uh, but also the, the general, uh, the speed of the expansion of, of China's nuclear program. Um, there were a lot of protests uh, in, in around this, this plant after Fukushima. And, and he, he has, uh, uh, Hezo Shou, who's a kind of well, um, well respected, but also a well known critic. So, you know, you might want to aim off for that, but, but nevertheless, he's a critic with, uh, with a solid scientific uh, knowledge. And, and this was his concern. It was really, uh, he, reached, he reached the conclusion that there was bound, pretty much bound to be an accident by looking at the history of the number of accidents per hours of operation globally in, in the nuclear industry and, and, and calculating the probability. But added to that, uh, concerns about the, uh, about the speed. Now this is, um, this is all, <laughs> rather on our minds in, uh, in the UK. Oh, sorry, one more. There is also public protest elsewhere. This was a protest in Guangdong, mm -hmm. um, and this was against uh, a nuclear reprocessing plant uh, three years ago, am I right? Three, four years ago. Um, and it was a successful protest because the local, the provincial authority then cancelled the plant, much to the fury of the central uh, government for, for whom the reprocessing plant was a key part uh, of, the, uh, of the overall nuclear program. So. There we go. Now, uh, it's, uh, it's on our minds in Britain uh, because of this man. Um, <laughs> uh, this, this, he's called George Osborne. You may not have heard of him. Um, if you're really into interior decor, you might have heard of Osborne and Little, uh, uh, which is the family firm. Anyway, George uh, turned his back on his in, in interior decor destiny and is now, um, <laughs> is now Britain's <laughs> finance minister. <laughs> uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, as we call him. In case you think that I deliberately chose that photograph, here's another one. <laughs> 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 so, so George, uh, George has discovered China. We're really proud. Who knew? Uh, there it is. <laughs> And uh, uh, Britain has had a relatively progressive climate policy for, for the last 10, 15 years. We have the Climate Change Act, you know, targets, all those things. Uh, but I have to say, this government has shown itself quite hostile to those, although it hasn't repealed the Climate Change Act. It has closed down quite a lot of uh, the programs which were enabling us to meet those targets, uh, including particularly the renewables program. Um, and he uh, is particularly uh, attached to the notion of nuclear power. So uh, two weeks ago, uh, Mr. Osborne was in China where he inked a deal uh, which has caused a lot of consternation in Britain. And this is to do with uh, this plant. Um, that, as you see, is a model. Um, that's at Hinkley Point mm -hmm. in Somerset in the west of Scotland. Now, this plant is, uh, <laughs> this plant is a model of a reactor uh, which 
uh, is designed by the French company Ravina and to be built by uh, Electr EDF, Electricité de France, the French utility. Um, this particular design has, has never successfully been completed. And believe me, they have tried. They have been trying for the last 12 years in Finland. Uh, they've been trying in France. They've been trying in China. Uh, none, none of these projects um, has, has actually produced uh, any electricity at all, but they have consumed a great deal of public finance. Um, in order to get this one built, uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Osborne has uh, committed two billion pounds of public uh, guarantee um, to try to get the Chinese to finance Hinkley Point. Uh, he's also, the deal would appear to commit uh, British consumers to paying more than twice the current wholesale price indexed for 35 years uh, for the electricity that it might or might not produce. Uh, so you can see this is causing little anxiety in, in Britain. Um, we have a number of rather aging plants which are due to be retired. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, the whole question of baseload, and I think this also goes back to what you were saying in China, um, we are living through an energy revolution which is really exciting, but of course it's causing all kinds of, uh, of fallout, all sorts of people are, all sorts of, of, of assets are being stranded, and if you look at Germany and what's happening there, and you see what's happening to the utilities there, it's really interesting, uh, but it, it has fantastic potential. Um, one of the arguments that is, that is still very alive, it seems to me, is the question of how much base load you need. So the justification for things like Hinkley Point or nuclear power plants in your grid are that it's all very well to have these fluffy renewables, but what happens when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine? You need base load. Up to a point, you need much less, it seems that you need much less base load than we thought. And in any event, the UK grid is now much better connected across the European network. So we have much more connectivity. So instead of balancing just inside the UK, we have the potential to balance across the whole uh, European energy network. And that makes a huge difference because it, it, again, reduces the amount of base load you have. And if you put 15, 20% of nuclear power onto your system, you inhibit the amount of renewables that you can subsequently connect. So you're actually shooting yourself in the foot. So there are all sorts of discussions, as you see, going on around this. But back to China, why would China finance a project which carries a very high, it seems to me, technical, economic, and political risk? Well, because uh, the, the quid pro quo is that they have been promised that they will uh, build and operate another nuclear plant at Bradwell in Essex on the east coast of Britain. So in return for taking on the crazy project at Hinkley Point, they will be given uh, their first uh, project in an OECD country, their first nuclear plant in an OECD country, which of course is a bit of a reputational boost since mm -hmm. to date the deals have been with Pakistan, Romania, Argentina, um, and, uh, and not, in, uh, uh, not in more developed countries with more developed regimes. So to get through, the UK regulatory regime to be building and operating a plant uh, is regarded as a tremendous uh, kind of sales boost uh, for the export of nuclear energy. Now, uh, I don't think I'm alone in wondering whether uh, it's wise to allow uh, Chinese state-owned enterprise to operate a nuclear plant. I mean, this is in Britain. This is a you know strategic infrastructure. It certainly wouldn't be allowed in in the USA. Um, so again, this is a risky project in many ways. There, uh, we have a tradition in the UK of uh, vigorous protest against uh, nuclear plants. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see as time goes by, should this, should this deal really be signed, how the Chinese state-owned enterprise deals with coming up against both the regulatory regime, but also the civic protest that is likely to ensue. So it's going to be a very interesting <laughs> test case. Um, it's going to be quite a concerning test case. And I'm, I, I think that it would be important for the Chinese authorities to understand that this could go either way, really. Um, and, and that this is not in that doing a deal with Mr. Osborne is not necessarily the end uh, of the story. So we'll see. Um, but that is. Uh, 
that is a fairly key part, it seems to me, of the uh, strategic role of nuclear power. Um, as I say, there are all sorts of profound debates going on about energy systems uh, in Europe, in China, in the United States. Um, and this one, however it turns out, I think is one to watch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right, come on back, Rick. And, um, yeah, so we got interesting case study, nuclear power. I, I think that your pre I've all of your presentations raised some, some cool questions. I, think, I know that at some point I want to have you guys, maybe John or Rick, talk about the question of baseload. I mean, I know that in your, in your model, um, the reinventing power, that nuclear power is projected to go up. And, and I mean, that's, I mean, it's an important sector for China. So just a question of that, that baseload. But I did, I actually, for the first time ever, I had someone, one of your colleagues, um, Rick, um, Chris, James, email, texted me a question. Ready for this? I've never done this part of the meeting, but the <laughs> question is about, is that all, but about green dispatch. Want a little more detail? Like how will, and we'll, we'll get the nuclear stuff too, but how will, how will green dispatch be implemented by whom and what regulations are going to be needed? And you have to do it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> That's where he's he really. He well, no, no, we, we'll have to have a full meeting on green dispatch later. But just, I think that we no. kind of we skimmed over it a little bit. You've heard uh, references by both Isabel and uh, John to balancing areas. Uh, and for those of you who don't spend much time in the electric sector, we're talking about those folks who match supply to demand on a you know, moment by moment basis. In China, right now, balancing is done at the provincial level. There are six regional grid companies that do some inter, that oversee some inter-provincial trading, but by and large, inter-provincial trading is not used to do the kinds of balancing that Isabel was referring to. Uh, the broader, the bigger the balancing area, the more diverse your system is, uh, the easier it is to uh, match supply and demand. It's, it's the electric system equivalent of managing your securities portfolio. Um, so what would have to happen in China is uh, an expansion of the balancing areas. Uh, this will be, uh, as a matter of governance, it will be uh, the NDRC that oversees it. Uh, the six regional grid companies are, five of them are owned by state grid, and one is uh, China Southern. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they would have to be empowered uh, to manage the overall system uh, and to reform the dispatch. So it ultimately becomes a technical issue, but um, right now it's, uh, it would be overseen by the NDRC. Um, I hope my colleague finds that to be a satisfactory answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'll text back in a moment like, that was awful, Rick. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, but let me just add one other thing. We'll also mention curtailment, uh, and this is an important thing. Again, with, with, with these, under the current contracts, the thermal folks are saying, you, you can't cut us back. We're entitled to our minimum number of hours, otherwise we have financial problems. And as John pointed out, that's part of the curtailment problem. Another part of the curtailment, and by, uh, just to be clear, not, curtailment means shutting down particular units, and in China it, right now we're, we're shutting down a lot of renewables, and a 15% curtailment rate for wind is huge. Yeah. Now, 5% makes, we see that elsewhere. There are times when, when um, it is actually more expensive to take the lower cost renewables because of the effects that they have on the system generally. And it, it, you know, this gets technical and so on, it's, but it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, Another part of the curtailment problem is what I just described, the inability to move uh, the renewable power, which is concentrated in mostly the northern and western regions of China, to the south and other, other places. And part of that problem is absence of transmission, but also uh, the way um, uh, pricing is done at the wholesale level, again, discourages uh, interprovincial trading. But then, but in terms of the grid, I mean, I mean China does have, I remember when I had, um, John Wellinghoff from FERC, he gave, he gave, first time we had a talk on the power sector here, and that's, I'm really excited that we could keep talking about this, because it's so, so important. But, um, but he was saying that, you know, that, that China has the most modern, you know, transfer lines, and that, it, that it's, that, it, you know, it seemed to be that the argument was that there's, it's, it's not just about technology and hardware, but, but in terms of the pricing. It is, there's, uh, certainly pricing, um, and the, uh, it also happens that, 
officials, provincial officials, are rewarded for economic, <laughs> that's what I uh, economic development, and that's measured by production within your province. So taking any kind of production, whether it's steel or electricity, and taking it from outside the province doesn't serve your, uh, you know, your numbers, your GDP numbers. So that's, there's another incentive there that needs to be uh, addressed as well, and also how you tax production. And again, when you bring in power from outside, you're not able to tax it the way you do for provincial uh, revenue purposes, uh, anything that's produced in the, in the province. So there's some interesting barriers that have little to do with the power system itself, uh, but a great deal to do with how uh, people are rewarded and advanced. Yeah, but there's also, but same thing with the incentive, I mean, some of the incentive of building nuclear power plants is that it's, yeah. it's driven by, you know, provinces. I mean, the, I know it's, they're centrally approved, but the provinces themselves, you know. They're very keen. Yeah. They're very keen. They're very keen. Because, and, um, but, but those, but those nuclear power plants would, would not be, you know, they just be, they're, they're usually going to be serving that province, yeah, right? Yeah, and I think part of the incentive is the notion that they also will, uh, they will stimulate. GDP, in other words, you know, they will serve provincial industries, therefore will stimulate GDP, so it creates some and I've, full factor. I've also, is there any truth to the fact when we were doing our initial choke point reporting, we were told that like one of the, in the northeast of China, where it's very, you know, it's very dry up north, one, one of the ideas that was being discussed was using nuclear power to, to power desalination, desalination plants. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one idea that, I, that was floated that we d hasn't gone anywhere, but again, Chinese engineers, was the idea of, of up at Bohai to desalinate water and then use nuclear power to help pump it to Inner Mongolia to help in the coal mining. Right? There was also the seawater canal. The seawater canal, the, yeah. yeah. And so, but the idea, but, but so, so nuclear for powering desal, that's not just, I mean, that's been, that's been talked about. It's been it? talked about. I don't know if it's, it, I mean, desalination is ramping up. I don't know what's, what's um, I don't know if it's it being powered in particular by nuclear, though it does coincide. You know, if you have a whole set of nuclear plants on the coast, you have, you know, that's where you do your desalination. But how explicitly they're linked, I, I don't yeah. know. So energy intensive water for, yeah. Th but there could be better measures. But uh, um, John, you have something to toss Well, I was just gonna, I wanted to go back to this question of baseload. Baseload, right? thank you. And we're at a, you know, we in the West are at an inflection point right now in how our grids are structured. And the concept of baseload is very much becoming outdated, right? Yes. With the ability to match supply and demand simultaneously and move either one of those as needed through demand response, through distributed resources, et cetera, the concept of baseload no longer is required, right? You actually would want to take the least cost of energy whenever you could, which increasingly is going to be when the wind's blowing or when the sun's shining and using large scale, you know, storage of different forms, whether it's virtual in the form of demand response, whether it's you know, real in the form of electric vehicles and, and battery packs and, you know, whatever else comes out. Um, and China, you know, because it has a predisposition toward centrally planned, large-scale construction-based projects, is at risk right now of taking the playbook from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s and steering its grid toward large-scale supply-only controlled, mm -hmm. you know, grid rather than migrating more toward an evolving, low incremental capital cost, high degree of flexibility grid that actually can manage itself economically in a much better way. And that's what our numbers showed that I, when I showed those decrease in rates, it's because you don't need to overbuild the infrastructure all the time for a decreasing load profile, changing load shape over time. Instead, you adapt as needed incrementally to each shift in the grid. So, so I do think you know, this idea of baseload and the requirements of baseload is one that we should challenge every step along the way as heretical, right? That was last generation's thinking, not this you know, kind of evolving given the confluence of information technology plus renewables plus storage plus everything else that's coming right now. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I couldn't agree more, but I think we, we're also seeing in, in China but, but I think elsewhere, we're seeing a mismatch in timelines between the, the time it takes or has taken to plan major infrastructure projects. So, so, you know, nuclear power plants, typically the decision process is 15, 20 years. In that time, the energy sector has been transformed. So you have the tremendous speed of evolution of, uh, of, of new energy 
um, including, I think, in storage, is going to is going to be very exciting in the next few years. And and parallel to this, you have this rumbling kind of 1950s structure of we will plan. You know, uh, <laughs> we will pour a lot of concrete. <laughs> we have to think about it. And once you get down that road, you've already committed, you know, X million right. to the well, planning and the thinking the cement, and the kind of right? yeah. You built the approach roads. You've had 17 committees, and politically, it's very difficult to back out. And I think right. you know, China suffers from this, but so do we. Yeah, yeah. yeah. indeed. <laughs> but May I just add a, a point? I have a question from John as well. I, f for the audience, this flexibility issue uh, can't be overemphasized. Um, historically, we've matched supply to demand, and demand is going up and down, and the, the, the system operators are reacting to it. Well, now we're adding another dimension of uncertainty, and that is the uncertainty of supply, because we're talking about renewables. But system operators are... are perfectly capable of dealing with this additional uncertainty. There'll be times when, when we'll have the supply that changes as demand changes. Sometimes they'll be working together. At other times, they'll be working uh, uh, at odds with each other. But fundamentally, we're capable of doing it. What's preventing us, and what our colleagues at FERC and elsewhere are spending a lot of time thinking about, is the, that this is really an economic concept. How do you value flexibility? How do you pay people to be to run their machines in different ways, to be on the demand side to respond to prices and change their demand either to increase it or lower it as circumstances dictate. It's all about the money and revealing the value. So uh, a lot of this work is being done here in the states, uh, and you know PJM, the regional uh, folks in this area, in New York, New England, elsewhere, are spending a lot of time thinking about. Uh, market mechanisms to reveal the value of flexibility in the, um, you know, from the shameless, uh, you know, commercial self-aggrandizement department. We've written about it, so if you go to our <laughs> website, there are some papers on this, this question, and, and uh, I, I think they're terrific. Uh, but it's, it's, it's an issue that uh, is fundamentally, in my view, an economic question. Obviously, there are technical issues, but it's fundamentally economic. But my question for you. Um, one thing that we haven't mentioned yet uh, is, and I, I hesitate to do so, but I, I'm interested to know what uh, Reinventing Fire in China says about this question. Carbon capture and sequestration oh. for coal plants. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just curious if you make any assumptions about it, because this is still an issue in China, and a lot of people are still talking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's in the context, actually, uh, it's sort of the flip side of the nuclear question. Yeah, so our study specifically did not include it as an economic technology that we looked at. That's not, we weren't making a call one way or another. But in the end, uh, lim limited need for it based on what we saw in terms of the overall requirements of the grid going forward, the ability to match and use the existing installed coal capacity in reasonable ways to balance, um, but minimize the amount of generation hours it ultimately required. Right, so the, the quick answer is there's a path without CCS for China. Right. Now, whether that's true for the rest of the world, okay. we would need to, you know, debate a little bit. But that, I mean. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. Did she have a question? Oh, we, sh oh, we should ignore them. Oh my God. All right. <laughs> We're having fun. You know, they can leave. The, you, know, you, go, you guys go get a cappuccino and come back. No. All right, um, so who had the question? Do we, do, do we let. You, you, the, you were pointing. You were well, taking my job. Hand. I saw the hand. Okay, where is sorry, the hand? Okay, me. there you go. Hi, um, John. Just oh, and just say your name and a. Oh, okay, I'm Jane Leggett from the Congressional Research Service. Hi, Jane. Um, and John just said it again about how the uh, the vision coming out would avoid or deal with stranded asset issues by increasing utilization of coal, and I'm wondering how that reconciles with this concept of green dispatch. So if you two could kind of expound on that, it would be helpful. Oh, so, you uh, made them so happy. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Jane, for that. Um, you increase the utilization of coal, but you're increasing the utilization of efficient coal and decreasing the utilization of inefficient coal. And eventually, your investment portfolio will change. So you'll just be using the coal you got more, more efficiently. A point that I wanted to make I didn't make earlier is, um, and John alluded to it, is that if you do this, if you go to merit order dispatch or some form of green dispatch, and they'll look, they'll look similar, they'll look very similar, uh, and you solve the contractual problems we were talking about earlier, 
the total cost savings that you get are enough to cover the cost of the stranded assets and still produce savings for the economy. That's at least the work that we've done recently with a colleague at the North China Electric Power uh, University shows that the cost savings are really significant and you can, uh, I hesitate to use this expression, but essentially you can pay off the people who are losing, which you have to do, and which is what we did when we restructured our systems here in the East. We paid stranded costs, uh, the difference between the market value and the historic value of these assets uh, that people built under a different regime. So you, you do that. That's, that's part of the, the deal. Does that, that, does that get good? OK, Steve. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Steve Andrews. I'm with the Congressional Executive Commission on China. Um, I guess my question is primarily directed at, uh, to Isabel. And I'm, I'm curious, sort of with uh, sort of Chai Jing and Under the Dome, uh, sort of what happened with that. And even more recently with the Tianjin port explosions as well, too. Um, sort of a, a lot of concerns regarding transparency. And so in particular in the nuclear sector, as well as the energy sector in general, transparency is incredibly important to sort of facilitate this transformation. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are on sort of recent trends in, in terms of transparency. For example, in the Tianjin port explosions, the government did some reporting on the logistics company and some of the shell companies involved or the ownership systems. So I is transparency improving and sort of what sort of trends are you seeing so for nuclear and uh, energy, thanks. Um, I take, um, I probably sort of take that in two parts. I think, um, I think in general, transparency. It's, it's a complicated story in China. We have a lot of, we have a lot of assertion from the government that transparency is important, that public supervision is important, um, and in some in some sectors we have much more transparency than we had. So, if you look at what happened with air pollution after air apocalypse, you remember that one about two years ago, um, and which was in fact one of a series of mega smogs in Beijing, which coincided with the availability of digital apps uh, which could measure uh, PM 2.5 um, and uh, you know kind of on top of the US Embassy which was uh, tr transparently tweeting uh, the real uh, the real uh, measures so so all of that meant that there were certain things you just could no longer hide and that precipitated a, you know big opening up of air quality data so now you have lots of uh, municipal and provincial authorities that actually do supply real time. You can go online, you can read real time air quality data. Huge change, right? But when you get to kind of major disasters, um, I mean, I think that this is running um, in parallel with a, a, a contrary trend um, that we see a lot of political anxiety at present, in my view, in the central government about the survival of the regime, survival of the party, a whole series of new laws which are about security of various kinds, the INGO law, I'm sure you know about them, the, the, the digital um, uh, securitization and, and all that. And the taking back into the hands of the party from the uh, organs of the state of the management of challenges. Uh, pol particularly political challenges. Now, what that tends to do once it retreats inside the party is to make it less transparent. So, in the case of major incidents where you would expect an upswell of anger, resentment, questioning, whatever it is, fear, such as Tianjin, uh, which we saw it with the winter rail crash, we saw it with the response to the Sichuan earthquake. So, when you get these major episodes where public opinion, and there's been a whole series, I mean, you know, one could go on. Um, what you tend to get is a, a kind of 24 hour, 36 hours of, you know, sort of allowing a certain amount of ventilation and then it just shuts down so that you actually don't ever get. Do we know where those dead pigs came from? Do you remember the dead pigs that were floating down the Huangpu River in the Shanghai's water supply? We still don't know where they came from. No, they committed suicide from the air pollution, right? That was the joke. <laughs> the they were maybe smoking too much. Was smoking too much. <laughs> but but uh, so, so, you know, if you, you actually go back and you, you look at these disasters and you say, what did we find out? Um, things that, you know, in, in another system, you would have had a public inquiry. You would have had, you know, you would have kind of got to the bottom of it somehow, even if it was years later and we all complain. That, but actually you don't. And, and so, so there, are, there are a number of concerns about that. One is lessons learned. You know, we don't know what lessons were learned 
or are being learned from Tianjin. Um, we don't know what lessons are learned about how you run an open planning process so that you get these problems <laughs> resolved before you know, the, the final decisions are made. You know, that sort of um, uh, accommodation and, and, and in encouraging of public participation and expert participation in the planning process, I think, is still, I think it's not really progressing. And, and of course, all of that is, is of concern in an eco program. Now, d just to go back to the question of regulation in the nuclear program, the Chinese have made great efforts to involve international inspection, international regulation in the nuclear program. And so on paper, the standards are international standards, and that, uh, you know, that's great. Um, the concerns that have been raised by the Chinese scientists that I referred to is how those will be enacted, implemented, and whether the speed is too great for this to be done uh, to any effect. And, and indeed, what might happen were there to be an incident. I'm gonna I want to talk about, I'm to kind of talking about nuclear switch in the question slightly, but now nuclear power is, is a piece of, of your scenario. But a bigger piece is obviously is the energy efficiency and the renewables, and a lot of that would be deconcentrated solar, more local, yes. which could help us take. And so I'd like to hear a little bit more maybe, maybe from both of you about the issue of, I mean, the energy efficiency. I mean, we've heard a lot of the low-hanging fruit, it's been picked. Caterpillars have nowhere to live. Oh, oh, no, 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 okay. No. Okay, I threw that out there, so tell me more. Tell me, no, you know, no, no. Because, but you hear that, like, well, you know, they've, they've only, because they've had these goals, but tell me more. Energy efficiency, can it, the other, well, who was making faces? No, no. You was it Mr. Energy Efficiency himself <laughs> in the front row? <laughs> you said you couldn't come and talk to today, so you be quiet right now. <laughs> <They don't. laughs> no, I'm just teasing it. So d tell us more about the energy efficiency and also deconcentrated solar, because then, as those expand, less of a need for nuclear. Yeah. Yeah. So on the energy efficiency side, um, there's China has done a lot in the 12th five-year plan. Uh, you know, all the way back to the 11th five-year plan has been making progress, but they're still well below Western standards in terms of overall efficiency. You know, and you see that in industry based on processes. You see that in buildings based on codes and standards and actual performance. There is a huge, huge opportunity for China to. Um, improve its energy efficiency. And again, by, by our numbers, you could roughly cut in half the amount of energy that China would need in 2050 relative to achieving the same comfort uh, levels in 2050, you know, were they to take a very different um, uh, approach. You know, and one of the big challenges that, that China has around this combined industrial efficiency and energy efficiency in buildings is right now China's buildings on average last about 30 years, right, which is less than half of what the typical Western standard is. And every time you need to rebuild, you, of course, have more inefficient cement kilns and steel factories running more and more, um, which needs to be stopped in the first place. But then the buildings themselves can be built to much higher codes and standards in this next uh, iteration of reconstruction that happens. And by our, you know, by the numbers that came out of our model, about 72% of the opportunity that China has to improve its energy efficiency in the building space is in buildings that haven't been built yet. Yeah. Um, and so getting the right codes and standards in place, getting the right enforcement practices in place here as soon as possible is absolutely critical to achieving that dramatic reduction in overall uh, energy efficiency here. On the, the solar side and the distributed, um, massive opportunity, obviously China Chinese construction is such that you're not gonna have as many solar, uh, you know, rooftops on residential um, houses as you would see in the United States. There are going to be more, uh, you know, solar community gardens and things like that that will emerge. But by our calculations, you know, about half of the solar in China based on, uh, or I'm sorry, it's about a third if I go by the numbers, would be in distributed form as opposed to centralized, uh, you know, large-scale plants. Because um, they have the, there are the regulations on the books. Regulations are on the books, but you know it's you have yet to see um, uh, you know kind of large scale, not even large scale, but any adoption of distributed solar right, right. now. It's only by companies that can disconnect from the grid where you actually see it being developed. Right. And so moving forward, getting you know finding ways, and we think companies are particularly international Fortune 500s are going to be the first ones that say, like Apple that came out with their announcement recently, but they're going to be the first ones that really demand that they have renewables powering their factories um, and will be the ones that likely help push from 
proclamation to actual action on this, right? You know, state grid and China Southern grid, are, although state grid more so than China Southern, are resisting uh, distributed generation for all the reasons that utilities around the country have, this country have, have resisted them, you know, until recently. It's about getting the regulatory rules right. Uh, there are financial implications and there are certainly system operational implications that, uh, that uh, you know. Because, they, because the whole, they, you guys, don't, the, I mean, because the whole issue is uh, like letting, selling power back onto the grid. Uh, it's well, not a technical issue. Well, it's, yes. it's a model. It completely right. changes the right. model. And it may or may not, uh, forget even selling it back to the grid, just not buying from the grid yeah. has implications. I just wanted to add one other thing on the previous point, which of okay. course I've now forgotten. What was <laughs> energy. Oh, energy. I'm going to talk anyway. <laughs> okay, energy efficiency. We run the last I just, hour. Um, I, yeah, and our colleague Bob Taylor is here, and he is uh, energy yeah. efficiency in China. Uh, and we'll done terrific that. work over the last three decades. I would just want to, I just want to add one other point. Something we've learned here in the United States and elsewhere, but really in the work that the United States has done on energy efficiency for the grid uh, specifically and more generally is that there's always more energy efficiency and there's always there's low hanging fruit. This is the most remarkable thing about this resource is that its cost isn't going up and there's always more to be found and to be uh, 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 mined. So when anybody says we've gotten all the low hanging fruit. But, but I think in China though it's been like politically low hanging fruit. Maybe that should have couched it that oh, way because it's that's I kind of meant that it's not easy. China's doing terrific stuff with energy efficiency, just not uh, just not sort of grid directed. Uh, the industrial much more so. Uh, and again Bob can can fill us in on some of the details. Bob, do you want to you have a question or comment? Cuz I do adore you. Okay, he needs a microphone though. And say who you are. So. First, I think the potential is huge in China, also huge in the U.S. and, and in Europe. So this, I work especially in industry. And in industry, um, well, it's true for buildings, too. And that is, this is changing. The energy efficiency world is as dynamic as the renewable area, at least. And so the, the ways that you capture more efficiency are changing. It's a, mu it's a very dynamic um, world and very exciting one, especially when you add in you know, the smart technologies and, and all the different kinds of monitoring and control that you can do. Um, I work in industry both in the U.S. and China, and we have a rule that's not my rule, but what I hear on the other side in the industries that I deal with is whatever potential we had 10 years ago or 20 years ago, they usually were 20 percent or 25 percent, and it's still 20 or 25 percent. Yeah. And that number, and everyone laugh about that, but it's, um, that number sticks. And so if I go to GM, where I was uh, a month ago, 20%. And, th and you ask them, you know, 10 years from now, and you've done your 20% goal that you made to DOE, or 25%, um, how much more potential will you have? Well, I think we'll probably still have it. <laughs> because it's changing so, the automobile industry is changing dramatically. So, so in terms in terms of the technologies to in help, terms of, yeah, and and technology not only in a hard sense but also a soft and a management sense. So in China, we see we've done ten years of uh, two big five-year plans of hardcore energy efficiency work, and I don't gauge it against the West. I, I I think your numbers are interesting. You still have gaps with the West, but the West is not the benchmark. The benchmark is what you can do, and China has the biggest industrial sector in the world, and they will do a lot. Um, it's before, and, and the projects that we saw in the last 10 years are almost like a black box kind of project. So you say, okay, I have this piece of equipment, I change it, put in a more efficient piece of equipment, maybe this boiler, maybe this air compression system, um, and then I've done my job. And so you, you have sort of a long list of, of typical energy efficiency projects, and then you know, doing them, and this is basically switching in, switching out kind of project. So if I go to a Chinese factory, sometimes I'll hear, say, well, we did all those that are on the list. What do we do now? And this has to do more with the system. Mm -hmm. so, so like anything, like the grid, is a perfect example, really. I hadn't thought about it, but it's, it's a dynamic system, production in, in industry. So it's not a question of just 
putting in a piece of mm -hmm. one piece and saying, okay, I've solved it. It's how the whole thing works together. Right. And this is the big push in China now. This is what you get from energy management systems. And this is what you hear Chinese energy efficiency people, especially in the industry, this is what they're talking about, is system optimization. And the potential there is huge. And this comes from technology, it comes from management systems, it comes from a lot of uh, softer things. But that's what we're looking at for the next five year plan and probably the one after. Okay, great, thanks, Bob. Some other questions out here? Okay, over here. I've been neglecting this side of the room, so I'm yeah. sorry. Um, thank you, I'm Amelie Thurma from the Free University in Berlin. Um, graduate student there, so allow me to read out my question. Um, to what extent do you expect that the shale gas will become um, a more pivotal pillar um, in China's energy mix considering the water scarcity problem and the other environmental risks that are connected with that and also regarding the challenge of compliance? Um, and do you think if it is a financially advantaged move um, to reduce the emissions? Thank you. So, I mean, she asked about shale, but we could even expand that out to talk about gas, because I think in your, in your modeling, you guys didn't really talk gas. Yeah. Well, I mean, the interesting thing about gas is that China really doesn't have the infrastructure for, to move gas around at large scale outside the coast, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so if you talk about starting to produce in China and then have markets to go to, you have to build not only, mm -hmm. you not only have to figure out how to, to frack the individual areas that China has, but you also have to build the infrastructure to get it around, which is quite costly. Um, and so when we looked at it from the overall numbers, it was a, it was a challenging road to go down. Um, that's a little different from what Chinese policy right now is, which is to develop that shale gas. As, as you mentioned, the shale gas is largely located in areas that are short of water. It's largely located in areas that are close to major urban centers, which are very challenging for uh, development when you look at that. The alternative is to build giant lines and pull in gas from, from Russia, of course, which, which is a- Which they are doing. I mean, which they are doing. They have a massive, uh, massive deal that was signed there about a year ago. Um, but, uh, you know, when we look at it, we say uh, they've already built this giant electricity grid. Um, and it's much easier for China to move around electrons than it is to build a whole gas pipeline and risk national security issues to less stable uh, trading partners um, for the purpose of continuing to co-evolve with hydrocarbons, right? And that there is a, a huge opportunity for them to use the assets that they already have to their world leaders in the production of solar cells, the world leaders in the production of wind turbines. Why do you need to figure out this whole issue around shale gas and develop it um, and build a whole secondary infrastructure that, again, is going to link you to last century's fuel source? And then, but, but again, but something that kind of relates to, you know, I see, I see China like a big chess game, chess game inside the cocoon, right? Um, that, that, <laughs> that you have these different, you know, the nuclear power, the interest groups, you know, they move forward, the hydro power, <laughs> <laughs> and now we got the, the shale guys. And, and I mean, again, you know, the Chinese central government, I mean, you know, they're in charge, but there's just a lot of the, the engineering pull or push in China, it's so strong. And so, I mean, that's, that you're kind of competing with that, right? These, the, these forces, the, 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 the gas. Ab absolutely. I mean, if you look at each of the last three years, the government has not hit its shale gas production targets. Yeah. Right. And now they're it talking that, it, it, that I guess we're, we might be a couple thousand years too late to actually tap that too, that, 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 that maybe the shale isn't going to be as easy. It clearly wasn't as easy, wasn't as rich it's as they much thought. It's more difficult in China to exploit the shale gas than it is here in the United States. But, it, but again, yeah. It's so partly geology also. Yeah. So yes, part of geology. Xinjiang, which is a lot short of water, the Sichuan, which is extremely mountainous, and the geology yeah. gets more complicated. Exactly. Yeah, yeah but, but again, but, but still you see these kind of like single-focused kind of push. Same thing for for the nuclear, but again, I think that even with the shale, that there is this mind of taking the experience and taking it global, right? You know, so that's, maybe it's a, it's a different meaning topic, but just, just kind of tossing it out there. Yeah, I, I mean, this is the, the allure of the centralized resources, exactly, yeah. to Jeff. Yeah. Okay, you have a question here. Uh, yes, my name's Trey Taylor. I'm with Burden Power. We're in the marine renewables. Uh, we're in New York City, and in New York City, uh, how they're getting to grid resiliency is to start creating microgrids in the city powered by DER. 
uh, Con Ed is getting into the solar power business. And that's how they're getting to the economic issues of all that. Is the same thing going on in China, in the bigger cities like Shanghai, uh, moving to microgrids within the cities? Uh, not immediately, but there's a good deal of talk about it. In fact, I want to turn it to John, who's putting together, can I say, you want to, uh, possibly a Shanghai project. Well, I mean, you, well you, were, you were in L.A. You were just in L.A. with all these cities talking about their efforts. What, I mean, maybe you could yeah, talk and if, about Yeah, and if we're uh, talking about L.A., we've, of course, got the godfather of the L.A. meeting here in Vance. Um, yeah. So we all need to give him a, a round yeah, of applause. Yeah, everyone. Vance from Climate um, Change Working Group at State. You um, did it, man. Because it was a remarkable uh, outcome. But certainly the, the – questions around microgrids as being central here going forward. Absolutely, um, you know, there is a strong desire to find resilient, you know, kind of modular approaches to the grid that allow large urban areas to, to uh, you know, achieve all the benefits of localized production um, and, and localized management. But, you know, it is right now more talk than its execution. I would say there are a few, in particular, where it's gone the furthest has been in industrial eco parks, which are large, you know, highly linked networks of factories. Not, there aren't, you know, kind of models of the circular economy yet that we would very much like to see, but there are, you know, kind of very large energy consumers all cited with uh, district electricity and district heat all together, you know, as part of the development. Um, the, there's a strong desire and a strong push, push, much like there is here in the United States, to, to proceed along those lines, but it, it's very early stages. I think in terms of permitting, it wasn't until just a year ago that, that microgrids were even allowed to be connected to the grid. Mm -hmm. um, and in, very in, in China. In China, okay. And, and very limited use of them in that capacity so far. So it, again, lots of excitement, talk, interest by particularly mayors uh, and urban leaders but very little execution so far. Yeah. Could I could I ask a question? Sure, you can. <laughs> because uh, you know there 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 are these um, there's another kind of great leap of eco cities, and it's it, I I have been told that one of the inhibiting factors in realizing uh, an eco city as opposed to a kind of fake eco city <laughs> is exactly that. It's the you know what state grid has been offering basically is a plug. You know you can plug in, but you can't but you can't connect your microgrid, you know. So, so you have to work with what state grid is delivering, which if you're trying to plan an eco-city from scratch, is not going to deliver what well, you need. So I'm just curious. As so to there is a big movement that has shifted, right? Eco-cities did have very little political power because right. they were largely a developer, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. fantasy, I'll say, uh, of what the, the future the world should look also. like, yeah. right? But now what we saw, in particular two weeks ago in the meeting in Los Angeles, is that you have... 11 cities and provinces that have stepped up and are going to be the front runners for this low carbon transformation in China. And those uh, provinces and, and cities all agreed to peak their carbon emissions early ahead of the 2030 uh, agreement yeah. by President Xi Jinping. They constitute, uh, you know, about 1.2 gigatons of China's emissions, yeah. right? So they're massive in terms of overall population contribution. And by our estimates, if they achieve their goals, they'll take about 500 megatons of carbon out of the system by 2030, just by being the front runners of the transformation that China seeks. And why that's different than EcoCities, again, is because now you've got some of the most important political leaders in the party that are stepping up with the resources and capabilities behind and the responsibilities of leading you know, cities with 10 million or 20 million people in them that are saying, we will carry this flag forward. We're going to make it happen. And that's a much bigger leverage point with state grid and, and exactly. southern yeah. grid to actually have change happen. So that gives them uh, the political <coughs> power to that exist with the inherently grid. Inherently, these different are relationships. some of the most important people in the, right. the Chinese government. Which right? is huge. And, yeah. but, and then also, but as Rick, to tie you into this, this little chat yeah, happening over here, is that, that you're saying that, that the reforms that we're seeing much more implementing legislation on the grid stuff Bob's getting excited. Bob's getting excited. Oh. <laughs> watch out, watch out. I, I just want to. Oh, oh. Wait, microphone, 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 webcast. You can't. And then I'll I, can't hear I just you. want to say quickly what you described about plug in only, this is changing. Yeah. Right. How fast it'll change, in what kind of inefficient ways it will change, 
but it is changing. So the regulations on distributed generation have changed. Yeah. And they're just starting to implement these at local level. You're starting to see projects, starting to see microgrids that are independent from the main grid. This is now beginning to be allowed. And so this world is really something to watch. Well, I, I think th if we talk about this a year from now, it would be, there would be a lot more. Yeah, all I was going to add is that I'm an unreconstructed regulator, so I see, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I see these things in terms of, of governance and uh, you know, policy barriers and overcoming those barriers. So when you align, uh, people heard us say this before, when you align the private interest with the public interest, you solve a lot of problems, and it's really about following the money. But but also but that again but this you know again to go back to what these agreements that of these cities in, in in Los Angeles is that I mean these cities are coming under increasing pressure from the public. Right. You don't need like official transparency. You know they have been more transparent about how horrible the air is, but you don't need anyone to tell them. The public they're getting lots of pressure, and I think that the cities. I mean it's kind of exciting that you know they're they they do see them as as being like a real. Well, if you look, the unilateral action that's been taken <coughs> on coal and restricting its overall combustion here has largely been by cities like Beijing taking the lead and saying, within the fifth ring you road, know. you can't burn it, right? It's not going to happen here. And that's led, you know, when you look at the actual numbers, and I was just at a, a separate discussion with some of the leading energy thinkers in China last week, and one of the most senior people in the Chinese energy establishment said, we have peaked coal consumption that it will go down because of the city-based movement here going forward. Um, and all of our projections are starting to account for that. Nanjing had implemented its own citywide coal cap a couple of years ago. <laughs> the only problem with that, and it was, it's great, but the only problem with it is that you, you end up having what we call leakage. It shifts the coal production, goes, mm -hmm. coal use goes elsewhere, yeah. which is in the short run, which is why a national coal cap and, of course, yeah. on, or the flip side in mm -hmm. ETS mm -hmm. is helpful here. So. Absolutely. I, I wanted to add one other thing. California, I, uh, Vance, your, your, your event two weeks ago, I, I was on vacation. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but California, as you know, has, been, has, has engaged on a, you know, a, a state to province base. Right. Changsu. And there's been a lot of action uh, at that subnational level that has, uh, has reinforced the movement that we're talking about here. It's been, it's been terrific. Yeah, well, so you've seen like Bloomberg Philanthropies, yep. Rockefeller Foundation, and, and then the other foundations supporting like NRDC and others that the cities, and the people we, you know, the world kind of woke up like, you know, 10 years ago, like hmm, cities are important. <laughs> and, and, but it actually to help build their capacity, because they're, <laughs> they, and, and, and it is, it's a very different, it's very different dealing with the municipality folks, isn't it? So, but that, I, and I'm really mad I, I wasn't on vacation, but I didn't get to go to your thing in LA. But um, hopefully there'll be more of these kind of gatherings. But well cities are particularly important, not just annual. because of existing cities, but because of urbanization, right. which yeah. continues in China. You know, another 100 million people are going to be urbanized. You know. And it also... So, so how those cities are built, you know, what that, that is absolutely... It's a critical opportunity. Yeah. And it also happens that, that it's at the city and provincial level that uh, more, if not most, environmental regulatory enforcement authority resides. Yep. Not necessarily with MEP at the national level. It's, it's the local environmental protection bureaus that that uh, uh, enforce yeah, these rules, and so again, at the city level, a lot can happen. But now that you said that, and, and, and don't you know, he said that Rick said at the beginning. Then we talked about it a couple of weeks ago here at a meeting here that the fact that environment and energy regulation is being linked together, maybe MEF gets a little more muscle. <laughs> maybe. Some other questions out here. Okay. We'll grab these two together. Thank you. Suzanne Fratcher with ReSustain. Um, thank you very much for your insights. Um, I just would like to get back to the um, environmental dispatch and ask you about the timelines that you think are realistic to get this really in, in forest and also overcoming the resistances, um, particularly uh, from the industry, the generator side, the grid, a state grid uh, side, as well as then taking perhaps a little twist on the effect of um, coal prices that are. Wow. Um, that question almost answers itself. Uh, oh, question. Okay. Same question. Same question. <coughs> um, I, I may not have uh, much of an insight here. How quickly can that happen? 
it can happen as quickly as political will and uh, you know desire allow it to happen. In my view, I I may be guilty of reductionism. I think the problem is a simple one to solve. I think it's fundamentally a contractual problem. And when you find a way to make sure that the current, the incumbents, don't lose money, in other words, they cover their capital costs, when you solve that problem, and in fact, there is a means for doing that right now in China. It's called generation rights trading. And it was extremely effective uh, at paying off the small coal guys who were all shut down, shut down nearly 100 gigawatts of small inefficient coal plants over the last five or six years. And their unrecovered capital costs were essentially paid through a means of, um, of purchasing, of buyouts of their contracts, mm -hmm. essentially how it worked. Uh, the new guys, the new efficient guys, bought up the remaining contracts, essentially is how it worked. It has been the hope that this mechanism would uh, be used voluntarily by the more efficient folks to buy the contractual right to produce more and the less efficient guys to say, okay, I can live with that. I'll, but it hasn't worked. Volu voluntary agreements have not been entered into in any, in any means. And that's actually the reason why the, the energy efficiency environmental dispatch <coughs> rule that was announced in 2007 has never really taken hold. Okay, so how do you solve that problem? As I alluded to earlier, I, th I think you go to an, actually an old-fashioned means of, of paying for generation. You pay for the capacity on the one hand, this is just a start now, capacity on the one hand, and you pay people for the amount of gigawatts, megawatts they have, so long as those megawatts are available to operate. Got to be able to operate. Got to be able to be turned on and turned off when the system operator says so. If you can't, then you don't get paid. But if you do, then you get paid. At that point, you don't care if you operate at all. Okay? I'm going to get paid. If I operate, then I get paid for my marginal fuel costs. Mm -hmm. That's how we did it for 70 years in the United States. That's how it was essentially done. I think this would be a simple and straightforward move for China. Uh, my colleagues at RAP and elsewhere remind me that it's much more difficult than that. Um, but I think that's where, that's where I w would point the Chinese. And the question then is, how do you reform the contracts? What, at what speed? You know, um, look, the, the folks who are getting paid now under the contracts as they are, they're used to that. They understand the system. Any change is frightening. And remember, when production exceeds the minimum number of hours, they make money. They make a lot more money. Okay, the system that I'm describing actually just means you get paid for your capital costs and your rate of return, and that's it, no matter what happens. Um, it does change the incentives, and you need to be careful about that. But as a as a first cut to a move toward a more competitive wholesale market, this makes sense because it reorders dispatch in a way that a competitive market does, without all the other dislocations that come from a major change in in um, the governance structure. That's where I would go with it, and I, I think you could do it in five years easily. That's, but I, who, who am I? What do I know? And I'm seriously, I, I, <laughs> Well, I mean, you look at the escalation of the issue, right? And it's gone from the NEA up to the party, and now the president is saying something about it. So I would, it's safe to say something will happen in five years. Yeah. Well, well, speaking of five years, we got a new five-year plan coming. Right, mm. and mm. one more question. One more question. So, we should be seeing some of this in there. I just want to follow up on that question before. Um, so if China implements green, green dispatch today, then the winners could be the more, in, more efficient coal power plants or renewables, and the loser could be the incumbent inefficient coal power plants. So I'm wondering, given that China have big generator, big generation companies, and they're investing both in coal as well as renewables, is there a possibility that they can cross-subsidy, cross-subsidize between sectors uh. and achieve that goal? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge your assumption. The, the premise of your question. I don't think there'll be losers in it if in, in this shift if you do what I've just described. What you're essentially doing is making sure everybody gets paid his investment costs, his or her investment costs. Okay, the inefficient guys operate less. And at some point, you'll you want to think about a system that does encourage them to shut down. 
But isn't that the, emission, the CO2 emissions trading system? That it helps the CO2, exactly. that up too? Yep. That, that <coughs> could, but that would have more of an effect in, in an actual uh, competitive wholesale market where that cost then gets, gets recognized as a competitive disadvantage in your bidding. So what I've described actually doesn't harm the inefficient guys. It just means they operate less. There'd be no reason in that system to cross-subsidize from dirty to clean or clean to dirty at all. There's, there's no, I don't see any economic benefit for the incumbents, you know, for the players in that circumstance. But I'd have to think a little more about it. I'd I think, well, you know what? <coughs> We've hit the bewitching hour. I mean, you, I mean, who knew? I mean, what I'm happy about, a room full of people that we're just totally geeking out on green dispatch <laughs> and grids. And so you guys, are, first of all, well, let's applaud each other. They were geeky and we were geeky. <laughs> Um, but thank you so much for coming. I have to thank the Luce Foundation for supporting the China Environment Forum on our, on our Choke Point Cities work, which is one of the reasons we wanted to dive on into the city stuff today. And got to have you come back when that, that full report is done and you can, we can go even deeper because there's a lot more that, this, that we can cut your work. It's, it's really like, been a terrific piece of work. It's awesome. It's going to be exciting. January, right? January. Okay, we're holding them to it. Thank you very much, everyone. Fantastic. Good work, John. Thank you. That's awesome.